Welcome back to the module Sustainable Biopolymers. This week in the lecture we will discuss about known polymers from novel biosynthesis routes. And the examples are BioPE polyethylene and BioPET polyethylene terephthalate. So it's your bag from shopping and it's your plastic bottle when drinking some juice. When we think about to contribute from renewable resource to the plastics, we have to think about the market. I emphasized that previously. Here we have a different view on the market. This is where all the thermal plastic resin uh, is located in. And interestingly, 90% of the market are only five different polymers. It's polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, so the two we are discussing today, almost 50% of the market, polypropylene, actually quite quickly also growing, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, you may have heard about some other issues, and then polystyrene. And the last 10% make up the rest of the market. We have the advantage of drop-in solutions so that we use the same polymer with all its properties but from a different resource. Instead of crude oil, as indicated here, we come from renewable resources. So exactly the same chemical, physical and mechanical properties as the fossil-based counterparts. And you can imagine if we have, instead of a PET, a bio-PET, if we have a PE, in, uh, a bio PE instead of a PE, then the manufacturers and the customers don't argue as long as the product has the same properties. And it has because it's a molecular uh, basis which is identical. So the question is only is the price the same? But first, we go on. Uh, with some of the arguments for drop-in solutions. Can replace all current applications of fossil-based counterparts? Existing processing plants can be converted easily. Sometimes one has to change the early part of it because from crude oil to the monomers, maybe it's a very different plant. But actually the polymer plant can be very similar or actually identical as soon as you have the resin. We have the existing end-of-life options where we have already a good recycling of PT bottles, for example. There is no change to these uh, market issues. And um, in, uh, the other argument would be that we don't have to develop all technologies new and all end-of-life options new and so it should be easier to have a drop-in polymer developed than a novel biopolymer with all its new properties. And then we would like to have a brief look into the synthesis possibilities. Here we have ethylene as a central molecule. Ethylene can be polymerized to bio-PE, to polyethylene. So ethylene is actually very uh, easily uh, produced from crude oil or from uh, uh, natural gas. And uh, it can be, it's also used for the production of ethylene glycol and then you get the PET. So the E in the PET is then from ethylene. Is there now a bio route? And there is indeed. You can use baker's yeast your alcoholic yeast fermentation, where you usually produce maybe beer or wine, you can use to produce bioethanol. Instead of burning it in a combustion engine, you can use it chemically to produce ethylene in a chemical step. And then you suddenly, with the same synthesis, from bioethylene, you can produce biopolyethylene and you can use bio PET. When you have the PE, in hand, you can think about properties. And as I pointed out, 
you can have BioP as a drop-in because you can replace acetylene from crude oil and gas, natural gas resources to bioacetylene. And then depending how you treat in the polymerization step, the polymerization, pressure, temperature, catalyst use, you can produce different fractions of polyethylene. And you see that sometimes even on your uh, goods you're buying. You have seen maybe these abbreviations PEHD, PEMD, PELD. And these are then difference in the density and the branching and very different properties. And that's very exciting for material scientists, but it's also very exciting for the applications because with the identical polymer, you can cover a lot of applications. Remember, only five major polymers exist, which cover most of the applications we have in our daily life for thermoplasts. So the degree of crystallinity changes, the light transmission, so if you have linear low density uh, PE, suddenly light is possible to uh, uh, transmit. And the melting temperature is strongly uh, uh, influenced by the treatment, by the polymerization of the monomer. So you can have strong and stiff material, while you have also soft and flexible. And there are some general properties of polyethylene and then also obviously because it's a drop-in of biopolyethylene. It's a non-polar thermoplastic semi-crystalline polymer indicated on the right hand side. It has a high ductility, low temperature impact resistance, good sliding friction behavior, so you can uh, move uh, different parts above each other. Good electrical insulation properties, we use that often on cables. Good chemical resistance. It is flammable, not so good, and poor weather resistance. This is when you use pure polyethylene. You have to think about that material scientists rather think about these polymers as yes, pure, there's crystallinity, amorphous, you can change already a lot of the properties, we discussed the slide before as well, but you can add additives and suddenly you get a weather resistance polyethylene, you get a biodegradable polyethylene and then the biogenic proportion differs. If you add more additives then you don't reach 100% anymore in polyethylene. Similar synthesis route in polyethylene terephthalic acid, PET. Again, Bakersis is used for the production of ethanol and via ethylene, the ethylene glycol can be synthesized. The bottles on the market, you will find several, they're called uh, plant bottle and others. The terephthalic acid is still from petroleum-based synthesis routes. And then polymerized ethylene glycol with terephthalic acid to PET. And then the fraction is not 100% bio PET, but 30% because of the weight of ethylene glycol versus terephthalic acid. But there are companies out there who really want to make 100% PET bottle a reality. And they use biological resources, maybe then bacterial fermentation, to isobutanol, this is one synthesis well, and to pyroxylene chemically and then have terphthalic acid and then have a 100% PT resin which can be used for bottle preparation. Manufacturing is identical in PT versus bio PT. You take the monomers, you transesterificate between 100 and 150 degrees with the catalyst then you have this nice ester and this one can then uh, in a condensation reaction be converted into PET resin. The properties of PET is identical with bio PET. It's a thermoplastic, semi-crystalline and amorphous proportion, so the unstructured proportion.
versus the crystalline can be influenced by the cooling temperatures. If you cool it extremely fast out of the, the molted uh, plastic, then you have amorphous material. If you want to have crystallinity, stability, brittle material, then you cool it slowly down. And there, again, material scientists can play with, and then the property of our bottle can be modified depending where the, um, uh, um, the plastic is. If it's in the bottom, you would like to have a sturdy, brittle material which holds all the mechanical strengths, while in the middle, you would like to have some flexibility. In total, high tensile strengths, high mechanical stability, it's dimensionally stable. Think about, put your PET bottle in a place, look after a year, it looks identical. Other plastics, they are moving. Highly transparent, we want to see what's inside of our bottle, heat resistant, absorbs very little water, and it has an okay gas barrier property. So we can have a carbonized drinking uh, in this bottle. We can change also barrier properties by uh, coating or multi-layer systems. Brascom, a company out of, from Brazil, one, uh, Brazil, one of the largest ethanol, bioethanol producers, is the largest bio PE producer. They use ethanol to ethylene and then produce uh, polyethylene. And it's sugarcane, it's a re renewable resource. It has more than 50% of the bio PEs from Brascom and the uh, capacity is actually increasing and already at 200 kilotons. Compared to the world market of PE, this is a small fraction but this is already industrial scale. And there are some interesting parts, for example, the green plastic in the botanical elements of Lego are now from BioPE. So these trees are now from renewable resources produced. But there are other companies who would like to advertise their products using a green synthesis routes of the plastics they use. And here's some some of the examples. Braskem is not the only one. There are a lot of end-user companies who would like to have the 100% uh, plant bottle and other packaging materials. There's, uh, uh, there's the companies Nestle and Danone. They have a timeline that they want to have the 30% quickly and this is what they can do. They buy the ethylene, the polyethylene from Brascom, then they would like to have an increase, 75% bio-based materials in just a couple of years. And the vision is also not so far away that 95% is from bio-based PET in the bottle. And we see other uh, consortia trying to aim for the same. And this is Coca-Cola with other large companies they would like to have uh, their combined in the PET technology collaboration, PTC, and again, they would like to have 100% plant-based PET material and fibers in consumer products. And with these strong driving forces from the market and from these uh, users, it will happen. But what you see is, again, research is required also for not only making these products a reality, but also that it impacts the total uh, plastic market. PET is 20% of the market. This is 60 million tons at least. Converting that to a bio-based possibility, we need a lot of technologies. And I hope we inspire you a little bit to contribute. Thank you for your attention.